and time's up on the pervasive culture of silence that has enabled abusers like Weinstein. These abusers that make it unsafe for women to go to work every morning to take a business meeting or event to report a crime without retaliation. We are here to ensure that the focus of this criminal case is on the perpetrators, the perpetrator's actions, not his victims, and that justice is served. The truth will prevail. And whether it is this trial or in the future, Harvey will be held accountable for his actions. And welcome to Long Crime Report, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. That's silence breaker Rosanna Arquette outside the courtroom last year when Harvey Weinstein was handed down a guilty verdict for his sex crimes offenses. Now, as we reported to you, a bankruptcy judge has approved a liquidation plan for the now defunct Weinstein company with $17 million to be allocated towards paying and settling the claims of Weinstein's victims. Well, joining me right now is a member of Weinstein's legal team and our very own long crime legal analyst, Imran Ansari. Imran, I'm happy you're here. I'm happy you took the time to speak with us about this. I know they're very busy with all the big news that's going on. So I'd like to get right into it. What are your thoughts on this settlement? And number two, if you can tell us, is there a reaction from Mr. Weinstein himself on this settlement? Sure, Jesse. Well, we know that this is the second uh, sort of drafting of this settlement agreement. The first one, which was um, thrown out by Judge Hellerstein in the Southern District. But this time, the uh, judge down in Delaware in bankruptcy court has taken this plan, the confirmation plan, approved it. And we expect that she's going to be signing off on an order, uh, the official order approving the confirmation plan uh, this week or early next week. Um, my thoughts? Well, listen, there are a number of claimants that have made claims against the Weinstein Company and, of course, my client, Harvey Weinstein. Um, this is an ability for those individuals, rather than take uh, their claims into court, uh, to get some monetary compensation. This money is coming from insurance company money. It's going out to settle these claims. Um, but as it relates to my client, you know, there's a lot of people out there showing their outrage, uh, yelling very loudly that this is not fair and that Harvey Weinstein gets a break. But in reality, he's not really getting a break at all because this second drafting of this settlement agreement allows someone to come into court uh, after they take some money from this insurance company settlement. They would, if they take 25 percent uh, of the money allocated to their claim, they could still sue Harvey in court. Now, I'm not sure how many of them are going to be uh, taking that uh, option and, and coming into court with claims. We do know that some have objected to the claims. Some plaintiffs are still pursuing their claims in court, and they're making it seem like they're not going to take any of the settlement money. Well, you know what? To those individuals, um, the, the reality is that they may be, at the end of the day, with uh, empty hands, because the Weinstein Company is a bankrupt company, and my client, this is public knowledge, he's sitting in jail. He's not exactly of uh, great financial health. So those taking advantage of this settlement may be uh, really the the wise move here, they're going to be getting some money in their hands. Of course, my client denies uh, the claims against him, uh, but this settlement will provide, at least for all parties, some closure as to uh, possible litigation on the horizon. Okay, a bunch of things to jump in there, but I just want to follow up. So you have, have you had a, ch if you can tell us, have you had a chance to speak with Mr. Weinstein about this? Has he given his thoughts about the settlement at all? Sure. Well, you know, obviously I can't go into the specifics of conversations, Jesse, but of course, I am in contact with my client, and I speak to him regularly about uh, the, the, the various pending matters that he's defending. Um, his take on this settlement, well, um, listen, he has signed off on the settlement. That's uh, the most I could tell you in regards to uh, his opinion of it. And again, uh, you know, those people thinking that Harvey Weinstein is getting some break from this, he's not. Out of all the parties that are being released mm -hmm. by this settlement, the Weinstein Company, the various directors and officers— he is not getting a full release. Again, there's this option for those claimants to take 25% uh, on the dollar and still sue him in court. So uh, again, what are his thoughts? Well, you know what? He's not getting any real closure from this settlement. So I'll leave it at that. You know, it's it's essentially allowing well, the doors to still be open. There was something that you just said that, that kind of 
there was something that you just said that kind of was interesting in the sense, he, you know, he still denies the things that are being said about him, these accusations, yet he signed off on the settlement. Isn't this almost an acknowledgment of, of saying, yes, it's true what these accusers are saying? I mean, a, a $17 million no. fund was allocated for this very purpose. Right. Absolutely not, Jesse, because that would take every settlement, not just in this case, but in every case, and assume that the parties settling, uh, if they are the defendant, are somehow admitting any liability. No, the essence of a settlement is that both parties are not admitting any liability. If you're a defendant, you're not admitting liability by that settlement. Um, you know, those who are not familiar with the way settlement works and the way litigation works may think that, hey, um, this by uh, the nature of the settlement is Harvey Weinstein admitting that he did these things he's accused of. Uh, but no, um, every settlement has this sort of non-liability clause. And if it didn't have that, Jesse, uh, not just in this case, but there would be no incentive to close out a possibly costly uh, and, and you know tireless litigation by way of settlement. Let me ask you this. You mentioned the people who oppose it. The attorneys for some of the opposers of this deal have said that this agreement pits women against women because they're fighting over the settlement money. What's your reaction to that? Well, you know, listen, I don't represent those individuals, and I'm not sure what's going on in terms of their conversations with their uh, attorneys or the conversations between the attorneys who are representing the various uh, women who have made these claims. Um, again, you know, this is uh, an opportunity for those people who have made claims against my client to get some sort of settlement money, uh, not only from my client, but from the Weinstein Company itself. Um, and those who are uh, choosing not to do that, well, that's their right. Um, and my client's going to be defending those claims. Um, of note, you know, we're talking about liability and the strength of the, the claims. Um, it should be noted that these individuals who are taking uh, this settlement, um, they will never have their case tested or tried in the court of law. Um, so if there are weaknesses to their claim, and I'm not pointing anyone out, but I'm just saying generally, if there are weaknesses to someone's claim, they'll never be put to the test. They'll never go through a deposition. They're never going to have to hand over any discovery. And they're going to still get a payout from this settlement. Again, the door is open still. My client doesn't get a full release. So those uh, rallying against this settlement as being somehow unfair or somehow benefiting Harvey Weinstein, I think they really have it wrong. Well, look, this is a major development and a major case that we've been following on the network for almost a year uh, since this trial was in New York. And if we go back to that, here was uh, Don Rotuno, one of his defense attorneys, uh, speaking about the sentencing. Good morning. That sentence that was just handed down by this court was obscene. That number was obnoxious. Uh, there are murderers who will get out of court faster than Harvey Weinstein will. Uh, that number spoke to the pressure of movements and the public. That number did not speak to the evidence that came out at trial. That number did not speak to the testimony that we heard. That number did not speak to evidence, nor did it speak to justice. I am um, overcome with anger at that number. I think that number is a uh, cowardly number to give. I think the judge caved, just as I believe the jury caved, and I am not happy. Now, Imran, as we watch this, one interesting condition of this settlement plan that wasn't in a previous version is that no money is actually going to go towards paying Harvey Weinstein's own legal bills. What do you think about that? Well, Jesse, as one of his attorneys, of course, I'm not too happy. But um, again, you know, people think that that was some sort of outrageous thing, the notion that money from an insurance policy would be going to a defend defendant uh, to utilize in order to defend a claim. Jesse, that happens in almost every situation where there is a case where a plaintiff is suing a defendant, and that defendant has an insurance policy that, pursuant to that policy, um, would provide coverage for that specific sort of action. That was the case here. Um, where there was an insurance proceed that could have gone to Harvey Weinstein. Um, it was part of a policy that he bargained for with his and agreed to with an insurance policy company. Um, and now that money is being taken away. So we can see the sort of, again, um, the capitulation, or um, I would go as far as to say unfair uh, aspects of this settlement, where Harvey Weinstein really isn't getting any benefit. He's not getting any of the legal costs that he uh, his insurance policy was to provide for. 
Um, and he's not getting any real closure or real release from this because it allows these people to still going forward with a, uh, a lawsuit while taking a portion of the proceeds in the settlement. So uh, again, listen, legal costs being covered by an insurance company, by a policy, that is something which is just normal. Whether you be accused of uh, um, you know, having a, a premises where someone slipped and fell and got injured, or where you're being accused of uh, uh, sexual abuse, as in this case. So there was nothing out of the ordinary from that. It wasn't anything shocking. But it went into court. Judge Hellerstein looked at that settlement agreement um, and put the Knicks on it. They went back and they took out all the stuff that could be arguably favorable for Harvey Weinstein, for other defendants, including the directors and officers in the Weinstein company. They took it out and now it's being confirmed. And I expect, although the objectors say they plan to appeal, I expect that it's going to go through. The judge is going to confirm it on paper in an order and any appeal uh, from the objectors will fail. Imran, uh, you know, while I have you here, I just want to take a quick moment and ask, you, what's the next move for Harvey Weinstein? He's got those charges in L.A. Uh, there's a question of extradition, when he'll go there. If you can speak about what the next steps are for your client, uh, that'd be really interesting for a lot of us to know. Sure. Well, we plan to appeal the conviction. I think that we have a real meritorious appeal. There's a lot of points that are going to be in that appeal, uh, which show that our client didn't necessarily get a fair trial from jury selection through verdict. Um, there are multiple instances that are going to be highlighted in that appeal, which I believe will show that there were certain actions, decisions, uh, comments, et cetera, uh, that did not provide our client with a fair trial. So that's on one uh, 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 docket. Uh, one point on the docket is that the appeal will be filed. Secondly, he's mm -hmm. defending these civil claims. And he intends to defend the civil claims. Those who are objecting and uh, choose to pursue, well, we're going to be putting their case to the test. We're going to be seeking discovery. We're, de we're going to depose those uh, individuals. And he's going to put on a defense. As to L.A., well, you know, I'm not talking about L.A. because I'm not his attorney representing him in the L.A. action. Uh, but what we are intently focused on, what he's focused on, is his appeal and defending the various actions against him, including uh, the charges in L.A. All right, Imran Ansari, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thanks again. And everybody out there, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, sure, we're going to focus on another high-profile defendant, Nicholas Cruz. Thank you. And welcome back, everybody. Let's go down to Florida, where prosecutors are asking a judge to allow them to present evidence that to a jury that Nicholas Cruz, the alleged Parkland school gunman, that he drew swastikas on both sides of an AR-15 gun magazine and on boots that were used during the shooting. Now, Cruz, of course, is accused of opening fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School back in 2018, taking the lives of 17 people and injuring 17 others. Now, prosecutors presented images seemingly showing these apparent hate symbols, and it should be noted that five of the victims who died were Jewish. So what are they intending to do here? Well, Nicholas Cruz himself was asked about the gun in his police interrogation. Watch. All righty. Got the little map. I don't know how much it's going to help us. Uh, let me sit that down. See if I can figure it out. How long have you had that gun? It took about a year or so. A year or two? Did you buy it yourself? Where'd you buy it at? I mean, you're 19, right? So did you buy it from a gun store or did you buy it from a friend? Gun store. A gun store. How much you pay for it? Five, six. Do you remember the name of the gun store? No. Was it, do you know what city it was in? Was it in Broward County or Dade County or Palm Beach? I mean, you can remember the price, so remember what? Margate. Margate? Okay. Is it like like a pawn shop or a, a, like, a, I mean, a real gun store? Got a lot of guns? Okay. Did you buy all the magazines there? Where'd you buy the magazines? Online. Online? How much did you pay for them? How much? 200. 200 for all of them or what, each of them? Each of them. Each of them? 
And how many do you think you, how many think you had? I don't know. Okay. But when you bought the gun in Margate for $560, how many magazines did it come with? A little five round magazine or did it come with one of the big ones? 30 rounder. Came with a 30 rounder? Okay, did you buy any other guns there? No? Is that the only gun you've ever owned? Other than the pellet gun you shot the chicken with? Have you, have you ever owned any other guns? Yes. What kind of guns have you owned in the past? Any other rifles? Any other handguns? No handguns. Okay, so you had other rifles. That gun you've had how many months you think? Three years. Three years? Two years. Two years? Have you ever taken it out to the range and fired or anything? Or was today the first day you ever fired it? You shot in your garage? In whose house? Your mom's house? How many times did you shoot in your garage? Two times. Just two bullets or two different occasions? Two bullets. What were you shooting at? The ground. You shot the gun in the in the garage on the com concrete? Yes. It didn't bounce all over hell in creation? No. Did it go into the concrete? Yes. Wow. Did you ever take it to the range or any, anything like that? Have you ever fired a gun like that before in the ROTC training? No? Have you ever fired a gun like that ever with anybody? Any friends or anybody else like that? What, what made you choose out of all the guns to want to buy an AR-15? Cool looking. Cool looking? Okay. Now, when you bought it, I mean, it was a legitimate purchase. They gave you a receipt and everything, right? So you bought it legally, right? They fill, you, did you fill out those forms and everything? Okay, you remember those forms? Okay, let's get into it right now. Joining me today, criminal defense attorney Gabriela Teresa Gonzalez and trial attorney Kelly Hyman. I'm so happy to have you both here because these are really interesting cases, and this one is an interesting legal argument, right? And Gigi, I want to start with you. Introducing the evidence of swastikas stickers on the gun or the, the magazine of the gun and the boots, what are prosecutors trying to do here? What's their rationale? Well, the prosecutors in this case are trying to prove that Nicholas Cruz was the shooter in this case. They're not even using this to prove that he had some sort of prejudice against the victims. That's going to be a big problem because this particular evidence uh, is definitely more prejudicial than it is probative, especially if the state is trying to prove identity. Well, they've got plenty of evidence of that. They've got videos of Nicholas Cruz. They've got eyewitnesses. And they've even got Nicholas Cruz's confession that identify him as the shooter. So I don't believe that the state is going to be successful in getting this character evidence admitted. Yeah, Kelly, Gigi makes all the solid points there. Why do you need it to show he's the shooter when you do have all this other evidence showing he is? And the, the point is, are you really right. just trying to sneak it through so that the jury can say, wow, this guy is really evil? What do you think, Kelly? Right. Um, you know, it's an interesting point you bring up, Jesse. And, but as you know, the state has the burden of proof. And so they have to prove that it was him. And my thoughts and prayers go out to anyone affected by this. I mean, this is horrific. Um, but I would I have to disagree. I, I do believe that the evidence is going to um, come in. It also helps establish that it was, in fact, him. And, um, and I think it, uh, the judge will let it come in. Uh, Gigi, I'll turn it back to you because having this on there... I mean, this is just another layer to this story. Uh, do they try to show the defense, if, if ultimately this is allowed in, that he wasn't the one who carved it? Is that what they try to show, that he wasn't the one who made those symbols? 
Or that the symbols aren't that, or that, uh, right, you'd have to try really? to claim that the defendant... Really? Well, you know, <laughs> they're not that? Hey, man, the defense is already stacked up against him, all right? We've got a hard enough job. Now you're asking me to try to, to defend these swastikas on the gun. You know, it's definitely not a good look, but the defense is going to have to turn... Uh, if it's admitted, they're going to have to turn away from that fact because, quite frankly, if it's admitted, it's just going to show that Nicholas Cruz is this awful person, is this awful monster that did committed this crime in the name of hate. Kelly, you step away from the legal angle. If we take this as true, he put those swastikas on there. What does this tell you about the mindset of Nicholas Cruz? Because it's, it's just adding more to the really disturbing story of this, this young man and a guy who's accused of killing multiple people, injuring others, terrorizing, creating nightmares and tragedies. And the idea that now there's this element, it, it just adds another framework to the story. And I'm curious your thoughts. No, absolutely, Jesse. You bring up a really good point. And as you pointed out, you know, five people of Jewish faith, um, you know, were there in, in harm because of it. And so I, I, I think it's important for it to come out. Um, things like this should not happen in our country. Um, we are a great country. We believe in democracy. But these kind of hate crimes should not occur. Um, these poor, you know, young people going to school to learn, and they have this tragedy for the rest of their lives. And they've lost loved ones and friends that will never be able to come back, and that'll be taken away from them for the rest of their lives. And, and you just wonder, with this new evidence coming in, it, it's just what, what kind of trial will this look like, and will this ultimately go to trial. There's so many moving parts in this story, and, the, and really, it just keeps on changing and changing. So we'll continue to follow it here on Long Crime. But I do want to bring our attention to another story that's gone pretty viral. Weird one. As if it couldn't get weirder, we're going to the Conways. And specifically, I want to talk about how a topless photo of Claudia Conway, the 16-year-old daughter of Donald Trump's former advisor, Kellyanne Conway, was circulated online. And Claudia publicly accused her mother of posting the photo. She even said, Kellyanne, you're going to effing jail. Then she switched gears and said, there's no way that her mom could have done this, that she loves her. She urged people to not call authorities. But the police are, in fact, looking into this um, because it's not clear how this image did wind up online. Gigi, I start with you. What a mess. And now what does law enforcement do to sort through this? Oof, this is a huge mess, especially when we consider the timeline of this sticky situation. You have a teenager who has claimed that her parents have been abusing her to the point where she tried to seek emancipation. Then you had the, uh, you know, a, le a nude leak of this teenager, a 16-year-old, which is a uh, state and federal crime. Uh, then you have the teenager accusing her mother of being the one who posted and disseminated this nude image. You know, it's and then on top of that, you have her recanting it uh, a couple of hours later, the next day, saying, "Hey, my mom had nothing to do with it. Back down, everyone, just go away." It's a very strange situation that investigators have to take very seriously. Because of the nature of this crime, we have child pornography and uh, revenge porn statutes that are being violated here. And it's important that the police conduct their investigation and figure out who posted those nudes, who and who circulated it, and who's in possession of them now. I, I do want to get into that. And just to give a, a little side note here, there's so much drama in this family. You had heard Claudia Conway say she was going to take a step away from social media to you know, spend more time. George Conway, of course big opponent, a critical opponent of former President Donald Trump said that he's going to take some time with the family to try and sort out what's going on. Uh, but Kelly, you heard Gigi mention, what does the law say here? Because you have a 16-year-old. Uh, whoever posted this, um, what could they face? What laws are applicable and what penalties, uh, if it's proven, if they're found guilty, if they plead guilty, what could they face? Right. I think Gigi brings up a really interesting um, point. First off, you know, how did she get this photo? Um, she's she's a minor. Um, she's underage. Um, she is nude. Um, so there could be a lot of ramifications because of that. And um, ultimately, you know, it'll be up for the prosecutors to make a determination whether if they bring something, if there is sufficient evidence to bring something, you know, whether it is um, some type of 
um, you know, pornography or some kind of photo of, of a minor or how the photo was released. But I definitely think that they're going to investigate and find out. No matter what your political philosophy is, you know, it, it's sad. No family wants their dirty laundry, so to speak, you know, put out there for everyone um, to see. And I and as you know, as as parents, you want the best for your children. And also as, as children, you want the best for your parents as well. And hopefully um, they can kind of work this out between them as a family and not let that um, affect them. But also it's important for the prosecutors to invest, investigate and, and make sure that justice is served. Gigi, let me ask you this, and what I'm about to say, there's no evidence to support, but as we're trying to figure out what happened, let's say Claudia either intentionally or accidentally posted this photo on her own. What happens then? Again, there's no evidence to say that that's the case, but if we're talking about possible scenarios about who could have done this, if it was an accident or intentional on her very own part, what happens? Well, whether it's accidental or intentional, the dissemination of child pornography is a major problem. Uh, and whether the minor consents to it, uh, whether she does or doesn't, is also not an issue because the child cannot consent to the dissemination of this material. So anybody who produced this child pornography, whether it was a child herself, whether it was another party, uh, even worse if it was a parent, is going to be treated uh, as a child producer, a child pornography producer, and they're going to be prosecuted very seriously. This is a type of case where uh, the courts uh, like to punish these types of defendants to detour others from engaging in this type of activity in the future. Well, it's really ugly because Claudia had originally said that her mom had screenshotted this nude, said it on TikTok. So I don't know. Well, I'm sure we'll get more answers as the days go on and figure out what exactly happened here, but it's a really sad and disturbing story. All right, we're going to take a break because when we come back, we want to talk about the new video that was released of that altercation with Trey Songs at the AFC Championship game. We'll be right back. And welcome back, everybody. We have an update for you in the legal drama surrounding Trey Songs, as we reported to you. The R&B singer, whose real name is Tremaine Neverson, was arrested for allegedly uh, assaulting a police officer during the AFC Championship game. And now we're learning a few more details, and there's a video of the incident that's been released. So let's take a look at it. I'm telling you, there's, there's no audio on it. But what you can see, and some things to note here, is that security was apparently called three times because Neverson was reportedly causing a scene and wasn't breaking and was breaking COVID safety guidelines, namely not wearing a mask. A uh, security reportedly asked him to leave. He refused. Police were called, and as you're seeing through this, allegedly punched a police officer and put him in a headlock. So the question is, who was justified? Who started? What could happen next? Uh, Gigi, I'll start with you. H how does this video change your your take or your view on what happened? You know, he, Trey Songs at the end of the day, was asked to leave by security guards by, for violating the stadium's code of conduct, right, which is to stay socially distant, wear your mask. Because Trey Songs was allegedly not complying with that code of conduct, he was asked to leave. He refused to leave. Then he was warned that he was going to be arrested for trespassing. He refused to leave. Then cops came over to arrest him, and then he violently resists arrest. I think Trey Songz uh, really did a number on himself, and the fact, coupled with the fact that he's got a history of assaulting police officers, this is not a good mix-up for Trey Songz to find himself in. Kelly, does it matter who initiated first? There's a back and forth of whether or not Trey Songz threw the first punch or he was tackled first. In this kind of discussion, we're not dealing with two civilians, but you're dealing with somebody who's law enforcement and somebody who's a civilian. Uh, does that affect the analysis? Because the question is, could this be self-defense? Right. No, Jesse, you bring up a really good point. So does Gigi about it. Um, it's hard to see exactly from the video. Um, but, you know, ultimately, he was asked to leave. He wasn't wearing a mask. People wear masks. I don't wear a mask for myself. I wear a mask to protect other people. And it's a shame that he did that. Um, but if the police officer asked him to go, even if, you know, he might say that it was it was self-defense, police officer will say that, um, that he was trying to get him out of there, and they have a right to get him out of there. I think it's going to be a losing battle for him, ultimately. It, it, there's, um, he was jailed, Gigi, uh, overnight on suspicion of assaulting a police officer, resisting arrest, and trespassing. But now 
uh, charges are being analyzed, reviewed by the prosecutor's office in Jackson County. What goes into that? Well, they're going to be looking at other videos. I know that there are witnesses who took cell phone footage of the events. I'm sure they're going to be investigating them, uh, looking through that video evidence to determine uh, what exactly went down here. But let me tell you what, the self-defense uh, defense is not going to be his best position because that would work if you are resisting an unlawful arrest. Here, it appears that he was resisting what seems like a lawful arrest. So it's going to be hard to claim self-defense when uh, you're defending yourself against a lawful arrest here. Well, you mentioned the witnesses, and Kelly, you, you actually hear on one of the tapes he did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong. I'm not sure who that person or these people are referring to, if it was the officer or Trey Songs. I actually heard one person say, arrest the officer. I don't know if that's in response to what actually was happening or it's more of a political statement. Um, but these witnesses, I wonder if they're going to help his story or hurt his story. Yeah, ultimately, we're going to have to see, you know, who exactly was the person talking to? Were they talking about the police officer? Or were they talking about him as well? Um, but the fact that he wasn't wearing a mask and he was supposed to wear a mask there, uh, ultimately, we're going to have to see um, who, in fact, it was. But if I was a betting person, I would have to say that uh, the police officer um, did the right thing. Uh, Gigi, one quick, one other quick question about this. You had mentioned his past record because uh, tr Mr. Neverson uh, had actually pled guilty to assaulting a police officer back uh, several years ago um, and disturbing the peace. He was sentenced to 18 months of probation. If this turns out to be a, a criminal case and he ultimately takes a plea deal or it goes to a jury and he's convicted, how could his past record affect what ultimately happens to him? Well, if he was currently on probation, if he was serving the 18-month probation uh, at the inception of this case, uh, that's going to really uh, murk up that other case. He's going to pick up a violation of probation. Uh, he's going to be extradited back to where that case is originated, and then he's going to have to fight the charges there. Um, you know, the fact that he's got a criminal history, the fact that it's a criminal history uh, regarding assault against police officers is not going to help his case in the event that he is found guilty or he pleads guilty and asks the court uh, to sentence him leniently. Okay, well, we go from one high-profile person to another high-profile person. I'm going to move to Massimo Giannelli because he is going to stay locked up behind bars in California. A judge denied the fashion designer's attempt to get out of prison early, where he's serving a five-month sentence, after he and his wife, Lori Lachlan, pled guilty to conspiracy in the college admission scandal. His legal team argued that he should be on home confinement because he's been improperly placed in isolation due to COVID outbreaks in the uh, prison where he was uh, being held. And although the court uh, recognized the danger associated with COVID-19, they're saying that they can't make a, a special case here. So, uh, Kelly, I'll start with you on this. Uh, there was a part where we first talked about this. We thought he might uh, be released to home confinement. That's not the case. Is that the right decision here? Well, I think ultimately the judge took all the evidence and made a determination. Now we know that there are COVID is rampant in, in the jail, um, but he's isolated. And maybe there would have been such a public outcry. Uh, people are very upset about the college scandal and the fact that he, you know, walks away and then is just basically at his his house and sitting there and enjoying that. So based on the evidence, I do believe that the judge made the right determination. You, you know, Gigi, the judge said that they want to make sure that they dissuade and deter others who may, like Gianelli, believe that because they can afford it, they can flout the law. In other words, if you provide special treatment to him, are you going to provide special treatment to other people? And yes, he has one of the most high-profile cases. He has money, a celebrity, if you will. And so that becomes an interesting uh, other rationale for the judge as well. I'm curious your thoughts on that. You know, whenever I hear about money gets you special treatment, you know, I, I disagree with that. I believe that money gets you the treatment that you're entitled to. And when you don't have money, then you get left on the wayside. And in this case, we've got a nonviolent offender who was sentenced to five months in a minimum security facility who ended up serving two months in isolation, which is supposed to be for to punish uh, offenders, uh, excuse me, uh, violent offenders. It's meant to punish folks who are disrupting general population 
And, you know, here in this case, you have someone who was thrown in isolation for two months for, quote, his safety to prevent the safety of other prisoners from getting COVID, despite Massimo Giuliani's uh, constant neg consistent negative tests. I think that it was always a long shot, but I think the judge should have granted early release in this case, considering the severity of his isolation, how long it was compared to what he was actually sentenced to. Kelly, can he appeal this? I mean, he's set to be released in April. Is there any way that he could get a different ruling and ultimately be released to home confinement or early release before April? Right. You know, it depends on the courts, but I, I don't think so. And the time wise, by the time it got appealed and went through everything, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but, you know, you, you never know. Um, you know, anything is, is possible. But uh, I, if I was a betting person, I, I would say that he would stay there the, the rest of his time and finish his, his time and then go back home. Gigi, you know, what's interesting. Uh, people saw this case from when it first started and that no one believed that Lori Loughlin or her husband would wind up in prison. They didn't think that, you know, Felicity Hoffman would. And what you're seeing is kind of a flip on it. Now, yeah, what they pled guilty to were serious charges that maybe in other cases you could have seen significant prison time, years behind bars. But even this amount of time and even a day in prison is tough. It, it, it seems to suggest that maybe the justice system is justice in a way and, and that this is exactly what they deserve in light of what they did and what they did to, to solicit these bribes and, and try to get their, uh, their children fraudulently into college. Yeah, I agree with you. I think they got what they got. And, they, you know, you, you get what you get and you don't get upset, all right? You committed a serious federal crime here. You pled guilty to that crime. And now, because you did the crime, you got to pay the time. And I think that they were sentenced appropriately in this case. Again, these are nonviolent offenders. These are first-time offenders. Um, you know, we shouldn't be uh, punishing folks for years in prison for nonviolent offenses. It's a waste of our resources. And, um, you know, it kind of adds more distrust to a criminal justice system that already provokes distrust. So I think that they were, uh, they were handled appropriately in this case. All right. Well, by all accounts, Massimo Ginelli is going to still spend the next several months in prison in California. And uh, maybe when he's released, he'll talk more about what his experience was like. All right. We're going to take a break because when we come back, it's hard to say, but it has been a year since Kobe Bryant, his daughter and others perished in that tragic helicopter accident. And there is a lot of legal fallout to talk about. We'll be right back. And welcome back, everybody. The year anniversary of when Kobe Bryant, his daughter Gianna, and many others died in that helicopter crash, that horrific helicopter crash, just unbelievable to think about. And there are still so many legal developments happening. Our very own Anjanette Levy has more on the story. It's hard to believe that it's been exactly one year since Kobe Bryant, his daughter Gianna, and seven other people were killed in that helicopter crash. As the families mourn, there are a number of lawsuits pending in the courts. Bryant's wife, Vanessa, and families of the other victims are suing the company that operated the helicopter. There is definitely civil liability. This is not an act of God. This is not an act of nature. This is <clears throat> what appears to be pilot error. That was aviation expert Andrew Maloney on Law and Crime the day after the crash last year. Pilot Era Zobion was trying to fly out of the clouds when the Sarosky S-76B helicopter crashed into a mountain last year. Other lawsuits stemming from the crash, the helicopter company is suing two air traffic controllers, and Vanessa Bryant is suing Los Angeles County and its sheriff's department. And oddly enough, Vanessa Bryant faces a lawsuit from her own mother. But as far as the lawsuit over the crash goes, Several factors are relevant, including the fog that morning. This time-lapse video shows the conditions. You can see just how thick that fog was before it cleared. It looks like weather played a role here. Um, I think uh, the fog, the, the conditions, of, the visibility conditions were very poor. Um, the LAPD had grounded its fleet. Now they may have a different mission profile than um, the helicopter that Mr. Bryant was flying on, but uh, clearly there was uh, a weather issue. The NTSB is expected to release the results of its crash report on February 9th, and we will bring those results to you.
For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy. Okay, there are a lot of developments to get through. Let's see if we can do it. Uh, Kelly, I'll start with you. The National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, says it's going to have a board meeting to talk about the cause of the crash next month. Uh, I'm curious what you expect to hear from that, because a lot of people are going to be watching it. I understand it's going to be a webcast to the public. What are you expecting to see there? I, a lot of information. I, I think a lot of people want to know, you know, whether in fact it was the pilot error, was it due to the weather, whether it was something wrong with the helicopter itself. And so I think that's really important. I think that's what we're going to have more information about um, a after that occurs. Yeah, just following up with you on that, because they said initially there, were, there was no evidence of mechanical issues or that the pilot, Mr. Zabayan, had alcohol or drugs in his system, but that he may have experienced something called spatial disorientation. I guess the question is, how much are they going to put the blame on him? Because that's really what we're seeing here. Yeah, no, Jesse, I think you make a really good point. And also, you know, was it his fault? What, did he get confused? Was the weather really bad? Should he be gone at all because of the weather was so bad with the fog? Um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. And if they say, yes, ultimately, it was the pirate pilot's error. He made the, he made the mistake. OK, uh, Gigi, so let me turn it to you, because now Vanessa Bryant, uh, Bryant's widow, has uh, filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the pilot's estate, his employer, Island Express, and OC Helicopters, which schedules these helicopter trips. And also, the victim's family members have sued Island Express as well. What do you make of that lawsuit? Yeah, I think it's important for the victim's families to go after every available party to seek their remedies. And here, the pilot, you know, that's the biggest fish here, right? Because um, unless we can prove some sort of mechanical error with the helicopter, we already know the helicopter wasn't equipped to um, handle um, weather readings and other types of readings. So we had to rely on the pilot's knowledge of how to, how, knowing how to navigate through this weather, this inclement weather. So if the pilot had knowledge that he couldn't do it and went up anyway, uh, that's definitely going to be negligent on his part. So it definitely behooves the parties to uh, try to seek whatever remedies they can from him because it's looking like he's going to be the big scapegoat here. Well, Kelly, Island Express, this helicopter company, after they're getting sued, they're now filing a lawsuit in a cross complaint against the air traffic controllers, uh, Kyle Larson and Matthew Conley as cross defendants. Uh, and they're saying that the accident was caused by a series of erroneous acts and or omissions by the both of them. What do you think about that? You know, that's that's interesting. It goes to the, the point, well, it wasn't us, and but it had to be someone else, kind of the pointing of the finger. It's not our fault this happened. And so we're going to, you know, um, bring in someone else because it's their fault. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out in, in the courts and ultimately what the court makes a determination on who was at fault. Yeah, and, and that's the question. Do you blame, is it all, is it just one person's fault? Is it a combination of different issues that led to this? It, it's unclear at this point. But Kelly, if I stick with you for a second, let's switch gears and not just talk about the cause of the crash. But now there's this lawsuit where Vanessa Bryant is suing the L.A. County Sheriff and the Sheriff's Department over the publication of photos from the crash site, claiming negligence, invasion of privacy, uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress, violation of constitutional rights. Your thoughts on that action? And that is, is is horrific. There are not words to I can say of how horrible it is. I mean, my thoughts and prayers go out the family. You lose a loved one, but then you have these photos and people are taking photos of them. I mean, that is just horrific. That is unacceptable by you know the police officers who did that. And I'm hoping that that's an isolated incident and that the police officers that did this will have ramifications for that because you shouldn't do that. I mean, that is stressful enough to lose someone and then have everyone to see the photos. That's just not right. And, and Gigi, there are a lot of ripple effects from the death of Kobe Bryant. And, and the last legal action I want to talk about is the fact that Vanessa Bryant's mother is suing her in California, saying that she wasn't paid uh, to be a, as a longtime personal assistant, which is something that Vanessa Bryant denies. We have about a minute left. Tell me about what you think about this lawsuit. You know, money and grief are a very difficult combination, and we're seeing that here. Vanessa Bryant, following the death of her husband and her daughter, Gigi, uh, you know, she became, uh, she inherited 600, the $600 million estate. And, you know, now her mom has all sorts of things to say about back pay and you owe me money and you owe me this. 
And it's really a sad development, especially considering the fact that this is just a year out from this incident. Vanessa Bryant and her whole family is still grieving. This doesn't seem like a necessary lawsuit, and yeah. yet it's being pursued anyway. It, it's sad. It's sad to still think about the grief, but all these legal actions that are still happening, which we will follow here on Long Crime Report. Gigi Kelly, thank you for taking the time. Everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow, 12 p.m.